Welcome back to the Neurologic Wellness Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Kappas. Today, I'm here with my guest, Dr. Isla Wolf. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, so, Dr. Wolf, uh, you are a doctor of acupuncture, correct? Correct. And then you've also um, joined the world of functional neurology in your practice as well. So I'm, I'm a little curious, how, um, what, what did your journey look like? How did you get to this point in practice? That was a very exciting journey. I have had a couple of my own concussions, which is what ultimately led me to seeking out functional neurology in the first place. I was working on my doctorate degree and at the time and studying the effects of acupuncture on cerebral blood flow and trying to understand, you know, what are the effects of acupuncture on, on the brain, on the central nervous system, and where is there a place for acupuncture in this world of concussion rehab? And while I was in my doctorate program, I uh, found out about the first international symposium of clinical neuroscience through the Carrick Institute, and it was focused on traumatic brain injuries. And that was uh, really my first entry point into learning about functional neurology. And I just was, I was hooked the, the, the second I walked in that conference. And what's been very fascinating for me and what I am reminded of every single day in my clinic is that um, because I do neurological exams, I'm constantly examining my patients and then doing my acupuncture treatments and then re-examining my patients. And I'm seeing huge changes in their nervous system. Uh, and I think the, the big wake up call for my entire profession is that we have for far too long relied too heavily on just gathering subjective information from our patients and once I started to apply a lot of objective testing, um, it lent so much power to, uh, to what it was that I was doing. And I think that uh, from a, again, from kind of this larger perspective of the profession, if we can start doing more research where we're utilizing uh, a lot of neurological testing, whether that's uh, dynamic computerized posturography, whether that's eye tracking devices, uh, if we can start utilizing these highly sophisticated uh, neurological tests and be incorporating that into the research to look at the effects of acupuncture on the central nervous system, you know, on the ocular motor system, on the vestibular system, on our sensory systems, I think that we would have a lot more information that we could give to the public to say, hey, this is what acupuncture is actually doing. Because right now, in from a public perspective, I think it's still very much a mystery to how it works. And I don't think that we're doing a good enough job explaining from a scientific perspective how exactly it is working. Um, so I think that once I my eyes were opened to incorporating all these tests, um, a, uh, it's been allowing me to explain in a much more scientific fashion to my patients and to the public in general how acupuncture works, but then also um, really fueling all of these great ideas for all this research that I would love to see happen um, to, to actually get some published data too. Yeah, um, I, I feel like most people have, a, have their own general idea of what acupuncture is, whether that's true or false. Um, can you maybe enlighten us on what the traditional dichotomy of acupuncture is and then kind of transition into what you're finding in the research with the, the brain specifically? And then if I might add, could you also maybe differentiate um, acupuncture versus uh, dry needling, which I think sometimes gets confused too? Yes. A lot of people ask me that question, well, how does acupuncture work? And I always <laughs> uh, would love to follow up and say, well, you know, how much time do you actually have? Because there are 
so many ways with which we can explain how it works. But to answer your first question, if we look at kind of this historical perspective, Chinese medicine itself, the way that it looks at health and disease, it has its own language. And that language is very foreign to, to people who are not familiar with it. And so we use a lot of words that seem strange, like we'll talk about liver chi stagnation, or we talk a lot about these kind of organ systems and, and, and functions in the body and label them with um, these kind of strange sounding diagnoses. And so I think that the problem with that is that while it makes sense to somebody who studied Chinese medicine, it doesn't necessarily make sense to people that have been living in this more biomedical world and looking at the body from a, this biomedical perspective. So there's a bit of a language barrier because of this um, the kind of the language that's used in Chinese medicine versus uh, this kind of biomedical perspective of how acupuncture works. And in China, they have been doing a lot of research for a very long time. Um, in a lot of other uh, countries, acupuncture research has, has been happening for a long time as well. Countries like um, South Korea and Japan and even Israel. I've, just, I've seen a lot of amazing neuroscience-based research coming out of those countries. And yet a lot of people are not reading that research. And so this, this there's this understanding that for... I, I look at the research, I read it, but then I realize, well, there aren't very many other people reading this research. It's not getting out there. So this idea that acupuncture is really working on kind of this um, ener energy of the body or it's moving energy around in the body or it's only affecting circulation is such a uh, oversimplified concept of what it's doing. Uh, because it's having a lot more profound effects on the brain, on the, on the central nervous system, on modulating a lot of functional networks in the brain. Uh, and so we now have that research, but it's just not being talked about um, enough. So that's the bridge that I'm trying to, to build where when we have a lot of practitioners who maybe are also are very busy clinicians and they don't have time to read the neuroscience research, a lot of them are still talking about acupuncture in um, kind of this, uh, this other paradigm. And they're not speaking about it from this biomedical or neuroscientific perspective. So I'm trying to bridge that gap to allow uh, practitioners to also be able to say, well, here's how we were taught how it works from this Chinese medicine paradigm, but here's how we know that it's also working um, in these uh, kind of from a neurophysiological perspective too, is that we can speak both of those languages and communicate in, in both ways. Uh, so, so there's that piece to it. And then I think one of the best ways to describe how it works is to look at dividing it into what would be acupuncture's local effects. So let's say I have neck pain, you know, uh, and I'm doing acupuncture on, on the neck. What are these local effects that are happening? And then we can look at what are the effects of doing acupuncture and even electroacupuncture techniques um, where if I'm doing acupuncture and I have my needles hooked up to a mixed frequency of say two Hertz to 15 Hertz, and I'm getting a really nice muscular contraction of those muscles. Well, now we're having a very robust effect in terms of what's being released locally. Uh, we're releasing CGRP, calcitonin gene related peptide, which then changes the circulation in the area. We're releasing nitric oxide, we're releasing interleukins, we're releasing substance P, we're releasing this whole chemical soup of neuromodulators. And so that's changing what's happening within the low tissue where there may be an injury or chronic tension. And then when we start stimulating those muscles with electroacupuncture and we're getting these muscles to contract, well, now all of a sudden we're activating these gamma motor neurons and we're changing the length of the muscle, which then um, we aff affect the muscle spindles. So now the muscle spindles, they're increasing their sensitivity. So all of this proprioceptive feedback is happening between the neck and the brain. And time and time again, when I have people that have had concussions, for example, they've got uh, post-traumatic neck pain, they have post-traumatic headaches, 
a lot of times that's very much intertwined. And so if we can release a lot of these neuromodulatory chemicals, and if we can, in a sense, change the sensitivity of those muscle spindles, well, now all of a sudden, the integration of those neck muscles into the brain changes dramatically, and people often experience a huge amount of, of relief that is lasting relief. Um, so, so we can look at kind of this idea of, you know, what are we doing locally? What are we doing in terms of what's happening at the spinal cord level? So we know that a lot of pain modulation happens in that dorsal horn. And so if we're doing acupuncture along the spine, um, we're finding that we can change what's happening within the actual spinal cord itself from a kind of top-down pain inhibition standpoint and a bottom-up uh, pain transmission standpoint. And then there's a lot of research looking at, well, what's happening in the brain itself. And that's really fascinating because we start to realize that this point specificity it is real. Meaning that if I do two different acupuncture points on the wrist, even if they are only two inches apart, what happens in the brain is actually different. Um, and so there was the study that looked at the difference between pericardium six which is you know, about kind of two inches up from the wrist and pericardium seven, which is right on the wrist. And if anybody's been on a cruise ship and they have had motion sickness, they've probably worn those little wristbands with the, the bead right over that pressure point for nausea. Well, this research looked at the difference between these two points and they found that when you needle Pericardium six, it actually activates midline structures in the cerebellum, which feed into midline structures in the brainstem, like the nucleus tractus solitarius, which is a huge modulator for things like nausea. And it also into, uh, it activates this functional connectivity between midline cerebellar structures and the insular cortex, which is where we have a map of our digestive tract. And the insular cortex has a huge um, modulatory aspect on our autonomic functions and plays a big role with nausea as well. So this acupuncture point that we've been using for hundreds of years for nausea, we now have this, you know, fMRI research saying, well, we actually have some clear data that when you needle that point and you stimulate the median nerve, that all of a sudden you activate these very specific networks in the brain related to how we modulate what's happening in the stomach. Um, but then if you needle pericardium seven, those networks are not activated. So needling a point that's just two inches away doesn't have that, that same effect. Um, so that's very interesting to, to appreciate too, is that um, how people knew this in the first place, you know, a thousand years ago, um, we don't know. But there's something to what is being taught and what's been taught for a very, very long time. And I, you know, I've, I've heard somebody else say, too, that when we don't understand how something works, it looks magical. <laughs> um, but once we, you know, have the scientific understanding of what's happening, then all of a sudden it doesn't seem so magical. We can explain what it is that we're doing. And I think for so long, acupuncture looked magical and it seemed magical, uh, but in reality, it is simply changing. You know, we're providing a sensory input, we're changing what's happening in the brain and we're changing sensory integration. And by doing that, we're changing the output, right? And so at, at the end of the day, um, that's really what's happening is we're, we're modulating the proprioceptive system um, we're changing the conversation and the information being transmitted through the spinal cord. And we're also in what using certain acupuncture points, we can modulate what's happening in these functional networks in the brain as well. Um, there's other research looking at the effect of acupuncture on the endogenous opiates and looking at, you know, using different frequencies again with electroacupuncture to stimulate the release of beta endorphins. Um, and other opiates and using um, that mechanism to help with pain. And then there's even been research that acupuncture helps to activate the endocannabinoid system as well as another pathway for pain inhibition. So there's so much happening that uh, again, isn't really 
common knowledge or it's not being shared or talked about a whole lot. And I'm, I'm trying to change that by giving people, uh, practitioners, you know, the, the tools to be able to explain this from a scientific perspective. Yeah, that, that is like incredibly fascinating. Like, I think that's, that's amazing. Um, have you found that, um, we talked about, uh, pericardiums, was it not seven, but, uh, six was, six. um, related to, you know, median nerve stimulation, which, uh, you know, ultimately helped with nausea. Um, have you found any other research that uh, looks at the other meridians or acupuncture points that, that end up correlating from a, uh, from a neurological perspective or maybe another uh, anatomical physiological perspective that they actually do uh, connect um, in addition to that? Yeah, I would say that with my functional neurology understanding of how powerful the trigeminal nerve is as far as sensory integration, I utilize that trigeminal system very often in my practice, especially for things like dysautonomia, for post-traumatic headaches, um, and, and even for post-traumatic neck pain too because there's a, there's a reflex going from the jaw back into the neck. And every time we open our jaw, you know, we've got um, a, a reflex that's changing what's happening within the cervical spine. And I've been able to you, do balance testing with the Brain EQ app where I'll test somebody's balance and uh, they'll score rather low. I will insert needles into points on the face that are kind of right in the masseter muscle and the mandibular uh, area, and then I'll retest them with the needles in and their balance will be dramatically improved. And so I, you know, to be able to change somebody's balance just by doing points in the jaw is pretty cool. Um, and that's where this kind of testing always come uh, is so enlightening because you get this immediate feedback but i've also found that i do a lot of pinwheel testing and when it comes to people with uh, post-traumatic headaches and post-traumatic neck pain you know what we find is that the pinwheel sensation might be different on one side of the face to the other or if they turn their neck and we retest it, we might see that, oh, when my head is turned to the right, that pinwheel all of a sudden feels sharper. When I turn to the left, it doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I get that kind of sensory input, I can often do acupuncture points on the face and uh, points on the neck. And then at the end of my treatment, I retest the pinwheel and everything feels equal um, regardless of head position. And so that trigeminal system is uh, something that I test very often and that I work with very often through using acupuncture on different facial points. Interesting. So uh, my, to my next question then, um, something that we often use in a functional neurology clinic is a uh, RPSS or SSAP type of stimulation uh, to, um, to stimulate these median nerves, trigeminal nerves. When have you found it to be more clinically advantageous to use acupuncture um, as an intervention over something like RPSS? Mm -hmm. I have those devices as well. And so I utilize uh, both. I would say, you know, with those peripheral nerve stimulators, a lot of times, um, you know, the, the duration might be for a shorter period of time compared to say if i'm doing electroacupuncture on you know on pericardium six which is right over that median nerve i might have a patient laying on the table with those needles in and that electrical stim for up to 20 minutes and so i think that it goes back to that idea of you know uh, frequency intensity duration um, I have, you know, patients with say that have had a stroke and have had a loss of uh, muscle, you know, strength on one side of the face. So I will do my, um, my peripheral nerve stimulators, but then I'll follow that up with acupuncture as well, because I know that once I insert that needle, it also has that release of all these local chemicals. Um, that's probably a different response than doing uh, just tissue stimulation. 
so once you're actually inserting a needle into the, the different layers of tissue, you have that release of all these other chemicals that have a beneficial effect as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then as far as your clinical thought process goes, um, you know, sometime, you know, we have these different meridians and acupuncture points uh, throughout our body. Um, if you're trying to invoke a change in someone's symptoms, would you say that you prioritize, um, I guess, the, uh, the brain and the brain findings that you're trying to address? Or would you say that you know, if you're looking at it from an acupuncture standpoint, are you trying to address the meridians and then supplement then with the, I guess, functional neurology therapies? Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm asking that in the best way, but. Yeah, yeah. I think that, and maybe some of this ties into your question about dry needling too, because it's more of a, a matter of, what map am I going to use in any given moment? And so while I may call this point pericardium six, you know, somebody who's doing dry needling might be approaching it by saying, I don't care what the acupuncture point is named. I just know what tissue I want to work on. And I want to, if I want to activate the median nerve, this is where I'm going to go. And so for me, you know, I have, I, the names of all the acupuncture points, but when I'm looking at my patients, I'm thinking more using a, a map of, okay, what nerves or what pathways am I trying to stimulate to make a change based on the, uh, based on the neuroanatomy uh, and based on kind of the physiology and based on the neuroscience research that I've read, but then also based on my clinical experience too, in terms of what points I'm um, you know, clinically seeing, give me really good results. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't know if I answered that. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, well. def definitely. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Dr. Wolf, could you walk us through what a typical exam would look like with you and maybe a typical visit, you know, what a patient could expect under uh, your care? Yeah, uh, I'll take, say, somebody that has post-concussion syndrome, for example, and because that's the area that I specialize in, those are probably the, the most uh, frequently seen patients in my clinic. When people come in, I start with my neurological exam. So I'm doing my assessment of the autonomic nervous system. I'm looking at, you know, the integrity of different pathways. What is the heart rate doing and the blood pressure doing when they're laying down versus standing up? Um, I'm doing vestibular testing as well, since a lot of these patients have vestibular disorders. So, you know, going through using my uh, vestibular first goggles, um, looking at, I'm, you know, doing a full ocular motor exam, looking at the pursuit mechanisms, saccades, anti-saccades, optic kinetics, you know, so I'm pulling all of this together as well as a full cranial nerve exam um, to try to understand all these different systems and pathways in, in the brain, in the body. Uh, and then also doing a sensory exam because acupuncture just has such an amazing ability to modulate the sensory system. So trying to understand you know, how, um, how these maps are in the brain of the face and the arms and the legs. And uh, so doing kind of a full sensory exam, a cerebellar exam, my gait analysis, and so trying to, to understand, you know, what is, what is the integrity of this patient's frontal lobe, their parietal lobe, how is their cerebellum functioning, um, do they have any movement disorders, how is their balance, What's, you know, what is the state of their vestibular system. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of, you know, head, eye, vestibular rehab that everybody else is doing, um, often giving patients exercises to do at home, uh, doing exercises with them in the office, doing any vestibular, um, you know, repositioning techniques, and then also pulling in my acupuncture where I see it to be most effective. Um, so obviously, if somebody has uh, something off with their vestibular system, I'm going to rely, you know, most heavily on vestibular rehab therapies. Um, but at the same time, 
I understand that that vestibular system doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's, you know, integrating with the sensory system and the ocular motor system. And so if I can do acupuncture points on the neck or the jaw and find that that helps with their balance and helps with the feedback from the neck, which then also helps with what's happening for the sensory integration in that vestibular nucleus, you know, it all, it all works together. Um, so I'm really combining a lot of the functional neurology, uh, you know, active rehab with, you know, acupuncture, which might be seen as more of a passive therapy. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, just gonna pause it for. So, what uh, would you say the reception in uh, the acupuncture community has been to kind of this advancement in research? And where do you think it needs to go from here? I see every single year that more and more acupuncturists are realizing that they would like to have more education in learning how to do neurological exams and having a more foundational uh, knowledge base on neurological disorders and what the pathophysiology is of these different disorders. So I, I think that there is a huge shift in my profession towards people wanting to feel um, you know, better trained in doing examinations. And when you look at the education uh, you know, these kind of entry level programs for people getting into acupuncture and Chinese medicine, they're very heavily focused on, you know, here are the acupuncture points, here are the needling techniques, um, learning the Chinese herbal medicine, which is extremely complicated and time consuming. And there's not enough biomedical uh, information being taught in some of these entry level programs. And so you have now these doctorate level programs where they're really trying to come in and say, okay, let's learn these orthopedic exams, let's learn these neurological exams. And then you have on top of that a lot of continuing education now where people um, are wanting to get more information and more knowledge. And I, I think that we're just going to see that in the next five to 10 years because as we know from an epidemiological perspective, neurological disorders are on the rise in every single um, age group. And so every single clinician is seeing more and more neurological based disorders. And so I think that acupuncturists um, by nature are very good observers. And so as soon as I start teaching neurological exam techniques, I love how quickly they pick it up because they're all read, their observation skills are already excellent. And you just start teaching them a few little things and they just take it and they run with it. Um, so it's actually very fun to teach those techniques to a group of people that is by nature very curious, loves to learn, and is already, like I said, already coming in with really good observation skills. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to my next question. If, um, if we have a practitioner out there who wants to learn uh, the marriage of neurology and acupuncture, uh, you, I think you teach a course, a few courses on that. How would somebody find that? Yeah, through the Carrick Institute and their store, uh, their online store, I have a two-day course that really is a great foundational course to understanding that marriage of acupuncture and Chinese medicine and this idea of kind of clinical neuroscience and a functional neurology model. And then in September, I'm teaching a three-day course uh, specifically for uh, acupuncture practitioners. That's all neurological examination. Uh, so that's happening September 24th to the 26th in Cape Canaveral through the Carrick Institute, and we'll also be live streaming it as well. And then I have a course um, specific to dizziness and vertigo as well that just gives people some of this kind of core knowledge on understanding uh, the difference between dizziness and vertigo and being able to kind of come up with a better differential diagnosis for something that usually um, is not accurately diagnosed. Uh, I get lots of people that come into my office with very vague diagnoses of 
of their kind of dizziness or, or vertigo episodes. So uh, eventually in the future, I hope to keep, um, you know, building on these courses and, and offering, you know, more and more to that specific population of practitioners that's wanting that education. And uh, on the other side of that, um, if there was a person out there, a patient out there who is listening to this and, you know, they really resonated with uh, what we were talking about today and want to explore uh, your care, um, how would they go about doing that? The best way is to visit my clinic website, which is healingresponseneuro.com. And I am located in Stillwater, Minnesota, um, which is right on the border of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Cool. Okay. Closer than I thought, I thought. <laughs> Pretty close to Chicago <laughs> here. Um, well, great. Um, I want to thank you again for being on the show today, Dr. Wolf. Uh, this was fascinating and, you know, amazing. From my point of view, I think our listeners are going to have the same response. Um, yeah, you definitely opened my eyes and world to acupuncture uh, today. So thank you for that. Super. Great. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, this has been your host from the Neuro Wellness Podcast. Be well. Thank <laughs> you.